Greetings and welcome to another exciting edition of Poet the Poet. I'm Robert Dunn. I'm hosting still. Uh, they, as I say, they haven't caught up to me yet, so I still get the host, which is nice. And we're coming to you from a legend, a legendary place on the poetry circuit, the Moroccan Star on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, just off Court Street. Um, home to a very long-running reading uh, hosted by our guest uh, this episode, Evie Ivy. Uh, here she is. Mm -hmm. Hi, Evie. <laughs> Hi. Hi. And we're grateful, actually, we're all grateful to the manager of the place, uh, Zachariah Kabari, who um, has let us uh, come in and film and has let Ivy run the uh, reading here on Sunday afternoons for so many years. And uh, we're very pleased about that. Uh, when you're here, I'll order the crepes, by the way. And. Uh, <laughs> And before I bring on before I bring on Ivy, although I know everybody's just dying to hear from her, I know I am. <laughs> um, I have a piece that is of great importance that I'm going to uh, share with you all because uh, we're about to branch off into museum readings. Um, by the time you see this, we would have done the King Manor Museum in Jamaica, Queens. And it's dedicated to Rufus King. Rufus King was part of the committee that wrote the United States Constitution. And you, the first instinct was, you think of that time period, you think he would have helped with the Declaration of Independence, but he didn't. And this poem explains why his contribution to the Declaration of Independence was shamefully ignored. It's called, Sign Here, Please, or How to Write a Declaration. Sign here, please. I ain't signing nothing. Six months on the committee and you guys never listen to me once. Jefferson got all the good lines, say you? Codswallop. And what are all you Philadelphia lawyers got to show for it? Some highfalutin razzmatazz jazz that'll never stand up in court, even in Trenton. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Hearsay. Hearsay. I believe that when Elbridge Jerry over there starts paying off his poker debts. He owes me 20 at least. Deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Does that include parking tickets? I got a million of them. They stuck a wheel boot on my horse. Horseshoes weren't good enough for him. Now he canters with a limp. So much for harness racing. Jefferson's idea, probably. Like his seven-day clock that ran under water, as if mudfish wanted to know what time it was anyway. Right to alter or abolish and institute a new government. How can you tell? But the same guys running year after year after year. I'll believe it when I see it. Sign here, please. And all those complaints, King George did this, King George did that. He talked to trees, you know, but you didn't even mention that. When my wife left me, all she did was leave a note on the bread box, said, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not. What do you mean, what's the rest of it? That was all there was. After all, it was a very small bread box. Sign here, please. Why? It's not like you used any of my suggestions, for God's sake. I had some great lines, four score and seven years ago, and the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, and all you guys said was, go stuff it in the Liberty Bell. Well, I did, right in the crack, and maybe some future generation will know good stuff when they see it, not like some of you hacks. Are you going to sign this thing or not? We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes. Ha! I knew they'd want money eventually. Our sacred honor. Well, that's cheap enough, I suppose. Sign it already! All right, all right. Watch where you're pointing that quill. You're getting ink in my wig. Hey, Hancock, how about leaving a little room for the rest of us? There. It's done. But, you know, if they really wanted this thing to fly, they should have included the money-saving coupons I proposed last month. The horse feed, the whiskey, the buy one, get one free at Betsy's Banners. You know, the thing's really worth fighting for. After all, it worked for publishers Schmearing House. And, you know, after all that, they erased his signature. And that's why Rufus King's name does not appear on the Declaration of Independence. So you get a little history with our program, Poet the Poet. And now, now we get pure pleasure with Evie Ivy. Oh, heavens. Yes. <laughs> um, 
Have you got a poem ready? Um, well, ready. Let's mm -hmm. see. Well, there's yeah. like, uh, mm -hmm. let me see. I'm going to read this one, which comes from a chapbook I'm putting together, uh -huh. characters. Uh -huh. Anybody and, we know? Uh, okay. Oh, no, a lot of characters. <laughs> <laughs> We got a, a lot, lot of, characters of characters on the poetry circuit. <laughs> and, yes. Anyhow, I'm going to read something called A Voice. Mm -hmm. A Voice. Its clarity becomes a sun through open space, a fresh bloomed rose under a morning sky. It resounds in a weighted promise. In those tones are gentle walks on roads of spring. If sound could be perfume and this bouquet be true, but it's one of those things that emerge less than shadow. This is a recording. <laughs> That's the kind of voice I get, at least on, on the phone these days. Uh, which character was that, by the way? Oh, mm, which uh, characters? Yeah, it's characters. Just, yeah. It's a character. Yeah. A character. <laughs> <laughs> we covered that. We know a lot of characters. <laughs> Here we only moments. name historical figures. <laughs> or, uh, there have been some shows where we've had hysterical figures as oh, well, but that's another course. story altogether. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Now... Uh, Evie Ivy, uh, in case you've tuned in late into the series here, because uh, we have done over 120 shows, and we're very proud of that. Um, Ivy was one of our first guests way back when. And Ivy mm -hmm. does a lot of marvelous things. Uh, she writes poetry. She does Middle Eastern dancing um. for money. Mm. <laughs> Let's face it. <laughs> she right. has poems about that, too. Mm -hmm. um, she's been a poetry editor. Yes. Um, she's taught workshops. And she's an expert on form, and I understand you brought some form poems. Um, I bought some form poems. I didn't bring too many of them. I do have uh, two well, others little, that I could read sample. that are not. Okay, uh, of the Cinquain. The Cinquain yes. is a short poetic form, mm -hmm. and uh, it was inspired by the haiku. Mm -hmm. And in the Cinquain is what you don't say that makes the poem. So when you read a Cinquain, you know you have to look behind it. And uh. it has its little economy of language, so you really have to choose your words, except you have to have, it's a five-line poem of two, four, six, eight, two lines, uh, mm -hmm. syllables, 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 yeah. five mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so your first line has to have sil two syllables, and it has to finish with two syllables. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read my very first one, which I think mm -hmm. I... Uh, I know it by memory, or you know, I have it up here, uh -huh. see if I can get it straight. But just in case I don't, <laughs> let me be sure and read something that is 24682. Uh -huh. I wake wanting to breathe in the day and then lose myself in it, moon in early morning. Of course, I started with I wake too and morning mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that uh, the other one that I was going to read was like some wild animal which must be tamed. You won't see reason. You just want to kick the stars. That was my Ouch. first thing, Queen. <laughs> I bet that's hard on the toe. <laughs> <laughs> That's Robert. <laughs> I'm afraid it is. Do, do, do some more. I know we she had him. a few. <laughs> okay. Um, I okay. have to say that. I'm the host. That's That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Untitled. Mm. He's back <laughs> in corridors of his past and there in a room vivid a boy worships Venus. Oh. <laughs> and let's see, there's another one over here. There's quite mm -hmm. a few over here, but yes. like mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. some of them I, I really don't read too much. Oh. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this was uh, one that I wrote uh, not too long ago um, at a late diner. <laughs> St. Quain, tell me it's noon and not midnight that we could move on and only think of the next delight. <laughs> and Life should just be fun. And the next tip. Unfortunately. Now, now <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but the Sin Queen was invented in California. By Adelaide Cropsey. 
Yes. I don't know. I think California. No, it, it, it was. It takes a Californian. And the reason, the reason for that is that a, they're wait, while they're waiting for the next earthquake to hit, they needed a really short form so they could make sure they would at least complete a few poems. And that's how they got the sinkwane. Really? Really. Would I lie to you on camera? Only Robert, and only Robert could reinvent poetic history. It's fun for crying out loud. Um, there's something else I've reinvented, yes. which I'm going to explain while you, while you search for your next poem. And, uh, <laughs> and basically, it's a poem about a subject that is not normally covered, uh, which is insurance. And we have insurance for all sorts of things. We have health insurance, life insurance, auto insurance, but there's one facet of human existence that nobody has ever bothered to insure, probably because any company uh, crazy enough to try it would go bankrupt in three weeks. And this poem will explain why. It's called, Do You Take This Policy? Having left the courthouse, pale as a snail, with my empty pockets flapping in gale-force winds, my ex even collared all the lint therein, it suddenly occurred to me that in the event I ever got married again, fat chance, but then, who knows, I would be well advised, having been so effectively cauterized, to take out marriage insurance. In fact, marriage insurance ought to be a mandatory act in this state the way auto insurance is. Here's what I mean without getting marginally obscene. You take out the policy when you whiz your John alias across the license at City Hall. It's automatic as well as compulsory, see? And in case of divorce, the insurance company pays the alimony, leaving you, the schnook, well, since you're insured, the erstwhile schnook, off the hook. And, if it please the court, I postulate a double indemnity clause for child support. I do not know what sort of clause to propose concerning the in-laws, whether the insurance should be more if they still like you, even after the breakup, even if they're doing it just to psych you. After all, you would expect to, be want, to, to, you expect to want to be rid of them, too. I always get tongue-tied when talking about insurance, you know. And let's not forget riders for fire, theft, frigidity, Collision, collusion, occlusion, being kitchen skill challenged, irreconcilable differences, and under insurance, in case your spouse is not as enlightened or frightened about such matters as you are, and let's face it, what spouse is, and what happy little insurance house would write such a cockamamie policy? Obviously, the one that canceled my auto insurance exactly five minutes before my last accident, leaving me up to my asphalt in bent fenders, medical bills, and lawsuits. Oh, brother, do those coots and my ex deserve each other. Yeah, no, good. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. It's a great idea. No one has thought of it. It's economically unfeasible when one out of two marriages end in divorce. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's great. You take out the policy, you don't pay the alimony, it's covered. You don't pay the child support, it's covered. Everybody, write your congressmen, write your insurance people. I mean, let's get this on the books. Right, and tell them Robert done thought of it. Yes, and who says I'm not politically astute? <laughs> uh, speaking of astute, I would be less than astute if I did not switch back now to Evie Ivy for some more poetry. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, I think the next, I'm, I have two more. Okay. And, uh, more than that, I hope. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, well, we'll take this yeah. slow. Right. Okay. okay. Stage manager. Oh, ho. I wanted to hold you, but what will you become again? A jack-in-the-box where I will follow you and you will keep me there forever playing simple Simon in the dark? I'd love to love you, but you might become a giant eagle and swoop me up to drop me in some anywhere land. And how will I get back since I am not good with direction? Or you'll throw me in the water knowing I'm not the best swimmer. Then you could play hero and rescue me just to hear the perpetual, oh, thank you, oh, thank you, only to drop me again. Mm -hmm. I want to hold you and not put blame on you for situations I find myself in. I'd love to love you, but if I have to play myself, I'll create my own scenario. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I want to hear about this one, too, because after all, we covered the Declaration of Independence. This will fit right in. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I, um, this came uh, to me from my... I love lace, and I had read this article in... in um, Linda Lovelace? In Curiosities. Who? I don't know who that is. She's a porn star. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that is. Curiosities. Okay. It appeared in Curiosities, and I call it my country's lace. What could a new country manufacture? In 1791, a Massachusetts town sent Alexander Hamilton samples of their lace for our beloved president. And that's from Civilization, uh, an issue that appeared April, May, 1997. He really wanted a new set of teeth, but let it go. <laughs> that's the epigram, and here's my <laughs> What could be more gentle than those intricate flowers and leaves devised by delicate fingers with those most soft cotton threads? Why not implements of war? What nation could survive on lace, especially lace that still waits to be shown, as is always with the gentle things? In my mind's country, don't call for implements of war. No guns, no torpedoes, no fighting planes. We deal in lace. Lace for the hair, lace for undergarments and outer clothing, lace for your shoes, accessorized with lace. Beautiful lace for beautiful people. Lace among forgotten pages as is always with the gentle things. And the lace is still sitting there. That's a relief, too, because my <laughs> shoe's untied. I'm going to have to... Since 1791. Since 1791, yes. We need the pretty lace. Oh, oh, okay. well, I have pretty... Oh, these are pretty <laughs> shoes. I can't open up their big feet. I mean, that's... A, I love him. <laughs> now, you've done a lot of chat books, haven't you? Well, I have... Um, Three chapbooks, two uh -huh. are coming up very, very soon. King of Fear, yeah. characters, I love myself the way I am. Yeah. And the first woman who danced that contains uh -huh. uh, my dance poems and some uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. And there's also this, which I managed to get a, a sneak a copy away from you. I, I rummaged through your bag when you weren't looking. Um, this is gardening. I, 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 <laughs> this I, what is, can I say? <laughs> this is gardening together. And... Uh, Evie Ivy is working on this with another poet, uh, name of Tom uh, Leschuk, and he's lurking back in the kitchen there, explaining how he wants his food cooked, but I'm going to ask him to come on out and uh, join us for a moment and, uh, and help explain how gardening together got together. Uh, Hello, Tom. How, how are you, Robert? <laughs> okay. Um, I explained that the food should be spicy as well as well done. Ah, okay. Uh, Gardening Together <laughs> picky, picky, picky. Uh, yeah, is a book that Evie and I have been working on for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little unusual in that all the poems are jointly written. Ah. And uh, it started uh, last fall. We were, after a poetry reading, sitting in a diner mm -hmm. uh, talking about things, and uh, <laughs> uh, we. Uh, uh, found that we both uh, saw as fascinating some of the latest photos from the Hubble telescope uh -huh. and it f uh, formed the basis of our very first poem. Oh, okay. Which I would like to read. What do you think? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, it's called 5 Billion FN. Yeah. And it starts with an epigram uh, from the New York Times. If it is coming straight at the Milky Way, there will be a head-on collision in five billion years. The cosmic cop waves the traffic by. The Chevy known as the Andromeder is a massive burning mass, <laughs> having run the red light and striking the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. There are no known casualties. An insurance agent has been contacted. <laughs> and what is the damage when millions of new stars feed the awe of the universe? The accident report is easily read. All languages have merged. Bystanders chatter, nodding heads, pods, and tentacles, using <laughs> radio waves for thought transmission. Probably a 
thousand miles a second. Okay, and we better hope so because there are a few and far uh, filling stations out there. Now you do one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no, oh yeah. I, I don't know which one. I, to, oh, the one that Tom just what, read is really one of my favorites. Whatever, but let me whatever see. appeals to you. Uh, what appeals to me, uh, there's quite a few over here that appeal to me. Uh-huh. All right, let's see. Um, oh, okay, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's me over here. Yes. You know, uh, you know, half the pages of this are blank. Uh, oh no, you know what? Oh, it wait, is? it's they a galley. Of course. It's a galley. What am I, what am I it's thinking? It's a galley. Of? It's yeah. a galley. Maybe I should it's keep on with pages. the that's why, of That's why Ivy can't find the poem. You see, she keeps opening to the uh, back of the page. Oh, there's one. So I'll read something uh, <laughs> that uh, is close to the one that was read. And again, this is uh, keeping in the theme of uh, of outer space yes. and uh, uh, the future of mankind, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Supernova. <laughs> and uh, it says over here, this has uh, again an epigram. Supernova will be the sun's fate in five billion or six billion years. John Noble Wilford, The Spectacular Shutters of the Dying Stars, and that was in the New York Times, December 97. The clock was ticking. It wasn't yet time. The sun still breathed, yet the change was coming. Mankind then was not your average neighbor. She, he, it had a tail <laughs> and little else except for that necessary built-in TV in the tummy. The tail switched and pressed the on button. The latest news at five was about the coming party, for the sun would grow fat on the inner planets and on one little moon. Man flying through light ears in clear glass bowls have gathered and swished just two stars over. The ships clinked together in eerie toast to the sun's change, to the future of the life it had spawned, that life that made the galaxy a meadow, a forest, a pond. Mm. Well, we do a lot of traveling in this poetry sure. racket. Uh, <laughs> when do you think the book will be finished? Oh, probably by the end of the year. Uh-huh, and then it will be available for all and sundry. Oh, absolutely. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting a signal that your lunch is ready. Ah, uh -huh. so oh, yes, I see so, it coming. So get out there and claim it. All right. And thanks for visiting, Tom. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. And speaking of the future, now I get to uh, throw in another one of mine. Uh, I have a book, <laughs> believe it or not. It's called Zenyant is in Bondage, put out by Cross Cultural Literary Editions. And I do deal with the future of mankind in this. Well, maybe a little piece of it. New York City, the next generation, twice removed. <laughs> 2029 was a banger year for the Big Apple South. We'd moved every skyscraper, every high-rise apartment, every bus terminal, and every sports franchise to Jersey, to Gotham Boys City to take advantage of recent commuter tax hikes. We'd put every major restaurant in the push cart so that gourmets could dine al fresco while gridlocked. We downloaded the outer boroughs, you know, like Queens, to Delaware, wherever that is, and by the way, what exactly is an outer borough anyway? We'd grown a new strain of man-eating pothole on the F. Lee Bailey, formerly the FDR, drive that could swallow the peak skill without even trying. Our crime waifs inspired at least one TV series on every network, except the delinquency channel, which considers them as kid stuff. We turned Greasy Mansion into a homeless shelter for wayward city councilmen, and we saved the $35 fare by selling all the subway trains to a herring cannery. I love New York. Well, that's the future, I suppose. I like the one about the wallet in there. That's oh, my favorite. I, I like another, that. Another, another time. Everybody's going to have to <laughs> buy the book so they can read the wallet, the wallet piece. Uh, now we come back to you, and I like another poem. Oh, oh, let me see if I, did I read? Did you bring um, a dance poem? No, no, not today, no. not today, but I, I, I might be able to recite one from memory. All right, let's take a chance. Okay, well, we're taking a chance on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Wordless Podium. It's one of, really one of my favorites. 
See them there, how they don't suffer from lack of words, how their expert minds like fingers can pick the words which will become lights over them. They can use these meaningless words, trusting their credibility to sell straw to hungry lions and beef to the believing cows. Give an ear and brood till the dawn arrives, thinking how can it take place? But you must smile, for life rolls on, no matter who's trapped under. And if you still have your senses, just be ready for the next take. Mm. Uh, it's about how people can actually look into the screen and then you see it in TV and lie about things that everyone knows are <laughs> lying about and yet they mm -hmm. do it and there's always someone who will believe them and swear that yeah. they're telling the truth. Would, Say no more. Okay. And that goes back a few years. Would, would you care for a Tonka? Yes, I'd love one. Uh, my friend Tonka Tucker has a few that uh, need airing. And a Tonka, you might say, is a stretch haiku except that Tonka is actually the older form. Uh, not many people realize that. Um, Custer's last band. When General George Custer crossed a sousaphone with a piccolo, he got a little bighorn. You would have attacked him too. Here's another one. Say what? <laughs> As my mind rots from kilowatt snot clots of sorts, I take pot shots at hot shots and hot spots who wear quartz shorts to cover sports warts. I can't repeat that one. Anyway, I think we come to the end. We haven't come to the end. You want to do another uh, sync wing? Another sync wing? It'll oh. probably take all the time that we have left for me to find one. That's and, all right. <laughs> uh, so uh, another sync wing. There's one. I, I'll write one. <laughs> I, I've got quite a few, but the yeah. right one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to read one called To Lily. He took her teary face, rested on his chest, told her the muse would take care of her. She did. Well, Evie Ivy, I want to thank you for coming on Poet the Poet, and thanks for Tom Aleschek for uh, dropping by, and uh, we'll be back next time with more exciting adventures, so visit us again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>